This is IAQ Radio, Indoor Air Quality Radio, the voice of the indoor air quality industry, with your hosts, Radio Joe Hughes and the Z-Man, Cliff Zlotnick. And now, Radio Joe Hughes. Good day and welcome to IAQ Radio Plus. This week, we welcome Dr. Jay Zhao uh, from the Executive Vice President at Delos Labs. We're going to talk about how modern buildings are integrating IEQ controls, lighting, acoustics, and more to make work environments healthy and high-performing. Before we get started, let's thank our sponsors. They're the reason we can continue the show. And don't forget, after the show, we have afterthoughts.iaqradio.com, sponsored by First On Site. IAQ Radio marquee sponsor is First On Site at firstonsite.com. IAQ Radio Association sponsors are ACGIH, the American Conference of Governmental Industrial Hygienists at ACGIH.org. AIHA, the American Industrial Hygiene Association at AIHA.org. IICRC, the Institute for Inspection, Cleaning, and Restoration Certification at IICRC.org. The Restoration Industry Association, RIA at restorationindustry.org. The Environmental Information Association, EIA at eia-usa.org. IAQ Radio Industry Sponsors are AEML Laboratories at aemlinc.com. Particles Plus at particlesplus.com. TSI Inc. at tsi.com. Tramex Meters at tramexmeters.com and Healthy Indoors Magazine at healthyindoors.com. And now you can win a cool prize. It's time for the IAQ Radio Trivia Question. Be the first to correctly answer. Simply email your answer to czlotnick at cs.com. Or if listening live, just text your answer from your computer. And now, here's the Z-Man. Hello, everyone. I'm sorry to report there was no correct answer to our last IAQ radio trivia question, which was to identify the year 1981 as the year that IAQ pioneer Hal Levin published an article titled Building Ecology. The IQ radio trivia question for today, April 14th, 2023, has been sponsored by TSI Inc., an industry leader in precision instrumentation for monitoring of indoor air. Learn how to expand your IAQ investigations at TSI.com. Here is today's IAQ radio trivia question, and it's a tough one. Name the biochemical oscillator that cycles with a stable phase and is synchronized with solar time. This oscillator's in vivo period is close to 24 hours. Back to you, Joe. Hmm. Good one, Cliff. All right. So today's guest, we hope, is Dr. Jay Zhao. He's the head of Delos Labs and an executive vice president at Delos. Delos is a wellness, real estate, and technology company headquartered in New York City. Dr. Zhao leads the research team to support product innovations and market strategies. His research focuses on human building interactions, and his PhD is in building performance and diagnostics from Carnegie Mellon University. Hello, Dr. Zhao. How are you? Doing great. Joe, how are you? Great, great to Radio meet Joe, you. Joe, is that what you called? Yes, sir. <laughs> Radio Joe on occasion, on Friday afternoons at noon. <laughs> 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 Welcome to the show. It's great to have you here. Um, you know, we, um, we, 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 we do a lot of shows with different people from different areas. You're kind of a mix. You, you do research, but you also work at a large company. Tell us a little bit about Delos Labs and and what you do there, if you would. Yeah, Delos is the company of a wellness, real estate, and technology company. Uh, we create standards, solutions, um, products, and programs to anything related to indoor environments and make indoors better for human health and well-being. Anything related, uh, air, water, light, acoustic, thermal, anything indoors that can make impact to human health and well-being. That's our domain. So Delos Labs is the research and scientific engine of Delos. We always say 
Delos is a company of, of rooted in science. Science is Delos DNA. We always say that. And that engine is Delos Labs, which I lead. And Delos Labs, we, what we do is we basically infuse science or scientific value and the principle into everything we do, anywhere from product development, product evaluation, scouting, to marketing, to sales, to anything partnership. So that's what we do. We infuse this principle of science into everything. How big is your lab group and then the the other part of Delos? Yeah, Delos is a very complex uh, organization. Uh, we have the Delos parent company. Uh, then we have a wholly owned subsidiary area uh, of International Well-Building Institute, which is uh, IWBI, you interviewed Rachel, I believe. And yes. then there's another subdivision called the Well Living Lab, Well Living Laboratory. The Well Living Lab is a collaboration uh, funded as a collaboration between Delos and the Mayo Clinic, one of the uh, top hospital and the medical centers in the in the in the in, in the U.S. Uh, if not in the world. So that's a separate entity of research uh, in the same topic. So uh, within so those. And, and then there's research and scientific team within both organizations as, as wholly owned subsidiary. Then there's Delos Lab as I lead at the parent company. So you see those connections. So um, if we talk about personnel all together with, within the Adobe BI, a standards development team within welding and lab, within the, the, the small team I lead in the uh, parent company, we have a, a about 20, 30, definitely more than 20, or close to 30 people with PhDs and uh, advanced degrees in uh, very dis interdisciplinary uh, fields, building sciences, health sciences, behavioral sciences, mechanical engineering, uh, computer sciences, public health, neuroscience, all of these interdisciplinary uh, 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 fields of, of uh, research. And where are you located? Um, our headquarters is in New York. I'm in New York. Um, and then the Well Living Lab uh, is located in Rochester, Minnesota, which is oh. the, where Mayo Clinic is. Mayo, that's right. um, and then Idle BI, the headquarter office, is also in New York. We, we do have offices in Australia, in Canada, in China, a small office in Dubai. Uh, we have a couple of people in Europe, based in Europe as well. So, um, so those are our, um, like, Foot, footprints uh, in the world. How is all of this funded? I mean, is it, you get grant money? Do you have the, the, the parent company maybe gets money from real estate or some other source? How does that all work? Yeah, so Delos as, as a corporation, um, obviously it's, it's a for-profit company. Um, sure. Right? So, so I'm not at liberty to talk details of who funded Delos and all of those things, um, but um, we're private equity funded. Um, it's a it's a market funded um, uh, company, and and uh, obviously we have revenue and all, all those things. So people with money felt like, hey, this is an area we should put some money into, um, with the goal of improving indoor environments for people around the world. I mean, is that kind of summarize things? Yeah, uh, of course. I think our CEO and COO of the company of Delos, uh, they have a lot of experience and they have a lot of reach and resources on on, on funding. And then, uh, you know, we started, uh, the company started eight, nine years ago, uh, well, almost 10 years ago uh, as, as a company. So over time, we grow and we, we got funding from different sources. And, and how did, let's talk a little bit about your background. How did you first get interested in indoor environments? I know you've got a degree in, in, in engineering. I, I think it was uh, not chemical, electrical engineering. Electrical, correct. Um, and then your PhD, which is, I found very interesting, is in building performance and diagnostics, which I didn't even know was available. And I'm, we're not far from CMU. Cliff and I are both from Pittsburgh. Oh, Tell us wow. a little bit about your background and how you got involved in this, this area. Yeah, um, I grew up in China and 30, 30 some years ago. And that was a time when the urbanization of China is rapidly progressing. I basically see a new building every single day. So even if I'm studying electrical engineering, building, building environments or building sciences 
Um, that's hugely important. It's also a period of time where pollution is very bad uh, in China. Um, uh, today it's better, but back then it's even worse. So that's why, uh, you know, the pa my passion has always been um, how the built environment can make can you know stop the pollution or or to less to be less polluting uh, the environment but at the same time making people better and healthier. So that's why I uh, after after uh, my electrical engineering degree, I applied for a PhD program uh, at Carnegie Mellon uh, for that specific building performance and diagnostics. So that's a very very it's it's unique. It's one it's, it's only one in the world. Uh, there are similar programs, for example, building sciences, building technologies by name. These are similar, uh, but the uniqueness in CMU, if you're from Pittsburgh, you would know the very heavily engineering mindset, but very interdisciplinary. There are so many other ar artists, um, architects, um, social science, uh, public health people. They're all working together in that uh, program uh, to to, to focus on two things. One, optimizing the built environment or buildings to make people healthier, happier, and more productive. Two is to uh, sustainability of environmentally, um, meaning saving energy, using less material, uh, use less water. So those are the, the things we do, uh, I did um, back at CMU for my PhD. And I believe that's the direction they're doing now as well. Interesting. We've had a few people on from CMU, obviously, in the past. Um, they were developing, what was that, the SPEC. I don't know if you're familiar with the SPEC. It was a little um, particle counter, essentially, that gave you, you know, blue, green, green red, yellow lights that uh, told you, were you, are you familiar with that program at all? I don't think I'm familiar with that, but I do know within CMU, um, civil engineering departments, electrical engineering departments, all working together, uh, we have collaboration with, because my degree is actually from the architecture department. So oh. these departments are working together to, 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 um, for the same goal of, you know, environmental sustainability and the human health. I got what I think is a really good text question from uh, our audience. What is the most, your most significant contribution to the arts and science of indoor air quality. Now, I don't know if he means by you personally or Delos. Let's start with Delos. What do you think yeah. their most significant contribution to the arts and science of IAQ have been? Yeah, um, that's a really good question. Um, I, I, I think I think Delos' major contribution to the society, um, whole society, and also to the society of IAQ uh, is we created the well building standard. And it is the single most trusted and most widely adopted uh, healthy building standards uh, overall, building globally. Standards. And, and go, go ahead. Yeah. Um, and and um, I don't need to you know, brag about the adoption, how many countries, there are more than 100 countries and all of those things. You can find the stats easily. But, uh, but the, the key is, because of that standard, a whole industry of healthy buildings, not only AQ, but all the other lighting, water, uh, acoustic, all of, all of the other aspects of it uh, are being more studied. The industry is coming, catching up. And, and that whole push of the movement, it's not only a standard, now becoming a movement of healthy buildings is, is, is really, really impactful to me. You know, one of the things I noticed about your background and Delos, 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 I'm not sure how to pronounce that properly, but um, is that you do focus quite a bit on things, you know, like um, lighting and acoustics. Can you tell our listeners a little bit about why you feel that's such an important focus in buildings that we don't often see? You know, a lot of times people focus on indoor air and not indoor environmental quality that includes things like lighting and acoustics. Yeah. So um, I think I think if we zoom out really, really uh, uh, from why we really developed the well-being standard or, the, or pushing this healthy building movement, we take approach of thinking from public health uh, landscape, uh, from public health lens, sorry, uh, lens. What, what are the most important factors in the world or in the built environment that can impact people's health from their standpoint? 
And the, in public health, the, the, the answer or the data has been there for decades. The data, uh, we, we work with uh, an organization called Institute for Health uh, Evaluation and Metrics. And they do have a database called Global Burden of Disease. In that Global Burden of Disease, there are different factors anywhere from smoking and, and, and uh, you know, eating healthy food to air pollution and to water pollution. All of these factors are linked to specific disease and quantified in a way that's me me uh, meaningful for comparing different factors in, 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 in our world, in our life. We use that database uh, as a starting point. And, and then we see what are the emerging signs, what are the emerging not yet categorized into huge public health database yet. So we make sure those two sets of data and, and research and, and realize, okay, some things are really, really, really there. It's facts, it's facts for decades. Everyone understands them. That's air quality, that's air pollution, that's water uh, contaminants, that's material safety, uh, that's uh, noise, uh, that's temperature. We understand that. Then there's an emerging uh, science in the really in the past uh, two decades, three decades, specifically on, on lighting. Um, so lighting, light, um, not including daylighting, including lighting of, of electrical lighting, including the light from your screen, right? From your phone, from your computer screen, all of those light has the biggest impact of our circadian rhythm. Circadian mm -hmm. rhythm is the 24 hour wake, wake sleep cycle of our body. Uh, it regulates our, you know, metabolic, metabolic rates, how, when, and what time you feel alert, when, what time do you want to go to sleep, your energy level, uh, all of those things. That's the circadian rhythm. And the light um, is the single most important external source to regulate people. Obviously, uh, the mechanism is light will uh, go through our eyes, mostly uh, 90, more than 90% of the light goes through our eyes. And then there's a specific cell in our eyes that's tied into the hormone generation of melatonin. And melatonin is the biggest and most important indicator of, of that, uh, that regulation of circadian rhythm. So if you see the causal chain, the light goes through our eyes, goes through that cell, and then goes through the melatonin generation. So that's why... <laughs> Uh, I say it's the external factor because you can drink coffee, you can take pills of melatonin, but that's not exter external. So, so uh, because of that, today in the I guess in the past ten years, really, the term circadian lighting or light and health is much, much, much more important. And actually, there was a, a Nobel Prize um, um, winner who discovered the function of our eyes and how that, how light impact our eyes through that uh, function, function I just mentioned, uh, won the Nobel Prize, which is a huge win for the lighting industry. It's not lighting industry, but it's the, the, the science of, of light and health. So today we do understand that during daytime, you have to be getting as much light as possible. Uh, one of the famous scientists in, in lighting uh, uh, told me personally, he said, uh, no artificial light can be lighter than, can be brighter than the sun during daytime, right? Nothing can be brighter than the sun during daytime. And after sunset, what you need to do is to be as dark as possible. Obviously, we're, we're living a life. It's not be pitch dark. It's not possible. But basically reduce the amount of blue light, reduce the amount of the light uh, intensity um, after sunset. So that's the best circadian rhythm. That's how people circadian supposed to be a pre-modern society. Um, so that's, yeah, that's the importance of light in the, in the, in the nutshell. It's not a nutshell. It's a long answer, but. Well, it's a great answer. And it's, it's something that's very popular. I don't know if you're familiar with the Huberman lab podcast, um, but he has tips essentially, but they're all based on research. And one of his big tips is to make sure that you get at least 15 minutes of sunlight every morning to help that circadian rhythm, I assume, so that you're not tired in the middle of the afternoon. Does that make sense to you? Perfect, make perfect sense. And we actually have a similar product evaluation and innovation to that point. For example, uh, energizing mirror, that term. In the morning, you should, uh, if you have a mirror and that mirror has lights, 
make sure that light is bright, very high, strong uh, in the morning time. But don't use a mirror, you know, during after in the afternoon or during uh, nighttime. That's exactly to his point. Now, does it make a difference what type of light, whether it would be from, uh, after, you know, the yes. old compact fluorescent bulbs or something different? Yes. So um, there are five different um, uh, factors of light that will impact your circadian rhythm. Number one is how strong that light is. Number two is the color of the light. It's actually the spectrum behind the color of the light, right? Number three is when, uh, what time you expose, uh, you get the exposure, uh, the frequency and, and the exposure time. Uh, and then the history of, of that uh, light. It, it's, it's a cumulative effect, meaning if you get um, very bright light last night, you didn't sleep well, and that will impact your today and even tomorrow. So there's a history of that. That's the history of light. That's okay. History of light. Yes. And then, so I talked about uh, color, the intensity, the frequency, the and then the duration. The last one is the duration. So um, you mentioned um, the other podcast. They recommend 15 minutes in the morning, right? Get sunlight. Uh, that's really a good recommendation. So the duration has to be more than 15 minutes, right? Uh, sure. There's no. There's no uh, no hard science says 15 or 20 because there's a lot of personal differences there, but duration definitely has a huge impact on that. So those five factors uh, is important. If we translate, is, that, go ahead. Right. Yeah, yeah, we, I, well, I, yeah, I'm just gonna say, is it generally safe to say you're better off getting sunlight than artificial light? Yes, yes. Uh, we, we we can differentiate in sunlight and daylight if you have direct sun that's the best if you don't have direct sun it's a cloudy day you get out you get daylight through the clouds that's also better um, so translating those five factors to specific electrical lighting property um, today a lot of uh, led lighting manufacturers have specific lighting for you to you know in the morning or in the afternoon or their smart lighting they can change throughout the day those are good things uh, in general. Those are good concepts uh, in general. But the difference between the daylight and sunlight and the artificial LED lighting, today mostly our LED lighting, is the completeness of the spectrum. The sun has the most complete <laughs> spectrum of, of the earth, right, of the world. Uh, but no LED lighting can be as complete as the sun, for sure. But would, would LED be the next in line? So from, from best to worst, can you tell us, is there science to back? What's the best versus the worst type of lighting to get? Yeah, I think it's, it's difficult to say uh, what's the, uh, after the sun, everything else is artificial lighting, right? It's right. hard to say what's best. What's, uh, and within LEDs, there's so many different technologies and different ways to to make lighting, so it's hard to say. Uh, but I would, what I would say is lighting that can tune the uh, color temperature, color temperature basically warm or cool lighting, uh, can tune that and then can dim, can dim the intensity of the light, uh, typically are better than just a regular light that cannot change. Um, because if you can change, you can do a better control of that. You can differentiate in morning or afternoon or nighttime. So that's lighting control is super, super important. Now, another issue with lighting is, and outdoor lighting and getting sunlight into buildings is, you know, that, that costs money. You need windows and windows aren't as efficient as walls with respect to thermal properties. How do you kind of... Um, you know, you know, take that into consideration when you're developing these standards. You know, we want we want a lot of daylight, which means you want a lot of windows. But on the other hand, that's also not as good for the environment as having a wall that maybe is better at thermal a better thermal barrier. Yeah, um, it's definitely a controversial. Um, it's it's a trade off, right? It's a trade off that um, the actual project team, architects, and engineers needs to make. Um, there's there's definitely ways um, to 
to have their different daylighting techniques, whether it's reflecting daylights from outdoor, indoor, outdoor to indoor. So we have a less, you know, relatively smaller areas of windows that's possible. You have a reflective device, but obviously that costs money too. So, yes. so there's a lot of trade-offs that can be made in the actual projects by the architects and, and engineers. Our standards, um, well being standard is a performance-based standard, meaning we don't dictate what exactly you do. We just say you need to achieve these goals, performance goals. Um, how you achieve that, that's your choice. And we'll, we'll incentivize you to, to, to be creative, to have innovations, uh, that's, that's okay. So that's how, 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 how we see that issue. Because we know it's controversial and, and, uh, and uh, it's so many ways to get the same results. So do, is there a, um, an emphasis also on whether the windows face south or north? within the standard and within your research? Is that something that's very important? Uh, in research, that's very, very important. And, and uh, even going back to my PhD time, my PhD dissertation, have, uh, have uh, studies and simulations and modelings of how facades with windows at different orientation may result in and uh, putting different shading devices and different uh, daylight reflecting devices uh, and different uh, thickness uh, or double pane or triple pane glazing, how that impacts the energy and the comfort as, uh, as well. So the whole, you can think of the whole building as the optimization problem. If you're thinking about math optimization, there are so many factors, there's so many constraints, and then you can optimize that based on whether it's daylighting, uh, daylighting is one goal, um, uh, energy consumption is another goal, thermal comfort is another goal, then you have inputs of the, all those parameters. You want to achieve all three goals, um, uh, but nothing can be perfect. It's a, it's a optimization. Interesting. Okay, let's see. I've got a couple text questions here. I'm, I'm going to try and get through them. I see one that I want to ask you. Do you track health, well-being, and productivity of occupants in the well-building standard? Um, how do you know, if you don't, how do you know the standard is making a difference? Yeah, um, so as I mentioned, so my team and myself, I'm not developing the Wellbeing Standard. There's a dedicated team in the International Wellbeing Institute to do that. Um, but we do have research. We have a research paper published recently uh, that's evaluating uh, before and after the Wellbeing Standard has been uh, implemented. And that paper, I'm sure I can send it to you or our PR agency can send it to you. So that's the, uh, there is a tracking elements, uh, or I would say evaluating elements of how how the actual results of the implementation of the wellbeing standards really make impact to the occupants. Yes, we do that research, and part of the volume lab study. Although we don't say, "Hey, we're doing this study for the purpose of wellbeing standard," but the standard itself. Um, uh, everything we do in Delos, in the parent company, in the welding lab, it somehow would be related to the content of the, the standard. Although we don't say it's, it's for that standard, but it's the same, it's the same realm, right? It's the same domain. So yeah, the research we do in the welding standards, a lot of them uh, perhaps can be seen as, as uh, validating some requirements, uh, although not directly. But the conclusion definitely will make that uh, more more uh, valid. I've got one more text, then we've got a break for what we call our halftime here. But it's from uh, one of our audience. Melatonin, as it is measured by our eyes, without melatonin, you stay awake. With it, you go to sleep. How does your lab measure that? How do you measure? Yeah, I don't even know how you measure melatonin. That's a good question, Tom. That's a great question. That's a great question. And the answer is simple. We don't um, because there are so many academic institutions, so many people in actual uh, uh, sleep uh, uh, medicine uh, that we work with. Uh, they do that job and they publish papers. We take, we review their paper, we take their conclusion and we understand them. We talk to them. We go to conference with them. We, uh, we partner together to do this type of work. So yeah, we don't, we do not do any uh, hardcore 
medical type of uh, rats or human work. We don't we do not do that. What about Mayo? Do they do something like that? Of course, of course. Yeah. Mayo Clinic okay. has a lot of uh, laboratories doing those things, and that's part of the reason we partner with them. Interesting. All right, we're going to take a break here and thank our sponsors. We'll be back with Dr. Zhao here and the head of Delos Labs and Executive Vice President at Delos. Our marquee sponsor is First On Site, your trusted full-service disaster recovery and property restoration company at firstonsite.com. Association sponsors are ACGIH, Advancing Careers of Professionals in Environmental Health, Industrial Hygiene, and Safety, Interested in Defining Their Science, ACGIH.org, AIHA, Healthy Workplaces, A Healthier World, AIHA.org, the IICRC, a nonprofit standards development and certifying body for the cleaning and restoration industry, IICRC. CRC.org. Industry sponsors are AEML Laboratories, free shipping, great pricing, same day results with no rush fee, AEMLINC.com. Particles Plus, feature rich particle counters and air quality instrumentation, count on us, ParticlesPlus.com. TSI Inc., an industry leader in precision instrumentation for monitoring indoor air. Learn how to expand your IAQ investigations, TSI.com. Tramex Meters, developing modern dynamic moisture meters and humidity monitoring systems since 1974. TramexMeters.com. And Healthy Indoors Magazine, a free online magazine for industry professionals and consumers, HealthyIndoors.com. All right, we're back for the second half of our interview with Dr. Jay Zhao. Dr. Zhao, let me let me go into the acoustics component for a moment here. And I I just want to warn you in advance, we're never going to get through everything we wanted to get through with you today. So we may have to bring you back for part two. Um, this has been fascinating. First, I also want to thank you for helping me better understand that whole lighting issue. I always I was always a little curious how that affected people in buildings and why it was so important with some of these standards. So I think you really explained that well. What about acoustics? I guess let's let's kind of go down through the same uh, question and answer that we did with lighting, but let's focus on acoustics. Why is that so important in indoor environments? Yeah, well, first of all, thank you for having me here. Um, never had a chance to thank you, but now thank you. Um, so yeah, Great acoustics. I, th I think there are, um, I would say, two major issues here. Um, the first issue is noise. Uh, when we think about acoustic performance in indoor environment, noise has always been an issue. And there are two types of noise. One is uh, really what we call is the noise that can really make harm you, uh, harm you physically. Uh, those are the noise that's in the factories. Those are the noise in the airport. You have to in the in the uh, you know shooting range. You have to wear the the headset. Those are the type of noise that categorized and also listed uh, uh, in the global burden of disease database. So those are the noise really are harming people or uh, quote unquote really harm your health physically. Then there's a type of noise we experience in our offices. Uh, you know we're hearing other people talking. The noise on the road. Uh, you know um, on the train you know, walking on the streets of Philadelphia or, or in New York, you hear those noise. Those are annoying. Those are the noise that makes you mentally uh, not happy, very right? emotionally not uh, uh, happy. But uh, it may be transitional, maybe, you know, acute, it will go away. So that's, that's the second type of noise. So that's a noise issue. And within indoor environments, we really want to minimize the second type of noise because hardly Hardly we get to the first type of noise to 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 make people really harm people uh, physically. So so uh, and it's not easy, uh, especially today. The open office is very common. Um, there are a lot of uh, uh, um, uh, a lot of ways, a lot of spaces for people hot desking, meaning you know people moving around in the office. There's no more you know cubicle uh, type of office anymore. So those makes the noise a uh, very prevalent uh, issue in most office space and commercial buildings. Then there's another issue in acoustic, which is we call speech privacy 
or speech intelligibility. Those are two things are kind of uh, um, uh, on the opposite end of the spectrum. If you want to have speech privacy, you don't want other people to hear you, 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 you talking and speaking, then you do want your space to be enclosed, to be absorbing sound and not trying, the sound doesn't you know, go too far. Um, that's, that's that. But at the same time, you, if you want speech intelligibility, you want people to hear you clearly, then that's the opposite, right? You want, you want that, uh, um, you will lose your privacy. So those are the issues we care about in most of the, uh, I, I guess, modern buildings or indoor environments uh, that we see. There are solutions, there, there are material, absorption materials, there are electronic solutions for, for sound masking, and there are other solutions for these, um, but there's not a, uh, a golden solution that you can solve all the problems at once. Um, so hopefully that answers your question. Well, yes. And how does acoustics affect health? Got it. Yeah. Um, physically and mentally, physically, right? Those very high level of noise, um, typically outdoors, typically in the factory, those will be basically harming your hearing, um, cause hearing loss. And uh, some of the, for example, electronic dance music festivals, <laughs> those are one of the biggest driver for, for young people's uh, hearing loss. Uh, hearing loss. Uh, um, but most of the noise in our office or in our like living spaces will not cause uh, hearing loss. That will impact our mental well-being. So mentally, uh, we get annoyed, we get more stressful. Uh, we, we get we feel more tired if we're exposed to to a uh, noisy environment. So that's how both physically and, and uh, mentally. And it's, it's a tough issue to deal with. So I'll take an example here in my own home. I've got a refrigerator. The refrigerator makes noise. Or I've got a uh, ventilator that does filtration and ventilation. Um, and, and it's also a dehumidifier. It makes noise. So when I'm trying to watch TV, I, I have to turn the TV up to compensate for that noise. I, there's other ways, obviously, I could try and do a better job of uh, insulating myself from that. What other innovative ways of dealing with acoustics are you working on at, at Delos? Um, yeah, I think that's 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 really uh, um, a tricky and good question because we evaluated a lot of products related to uh, part of my job, part of our team's job is to evaluating what's out there in the market, right? What's latest, uh, innovative, and acoustic is definitely part of it. And uh, we do have uh, solutions. They may not be innovative. You may have know or heard of them, but they're effective. For example, acoustic insulation panels, um, you can have, and they're made today, they're made really pretty, um, like a piece of artwork, like a piece of, uh, um, uh, uh, carpets you can hang on the wall and in between your uh, utility room and in your uh, bedroom or in your uh, office. So those are one type. And then uh, the other thing is um, some of the green walls, the moss, you know, the moss dried, uh, chemically dried moss walls. Those are good uh, absorption materials you can you can put on your uh, wall as well. Then there are also electronic devices they call a sound masking. They can do directional masking on different sound uh, by, by uh, producing another type of sound. Uh, um, there are also, also uh, um, I don't know what you call that. It's basically a speaker that can, can produce nature pleasant sound. So you basically use one sound to mask the other sound. And this new sound is what you like to hear. For example, uh, birds or the forest or the ocean or the waves, all of those things uh, could be good to, to, to uh, masking some of the uh, uh, constant and low volume uh, HVAC system or you know, dehumidifier sound noise. Yeah, like today, these mini split um, air source heat pumps. Heat pumps, yeah. They're everywhere, but they do make, they're not real loud, but they make a little bit of noise and you've got to figure out a way. So maybe we would put some kind of a uh, acoustical panel close by to help with that. 
Yeah, um, it, it's, it's the same concept as the thermal insulation versus, you know, insulating heat, you're insulating sound, the same concept. But I could see the problem being that now, now you may be, that panel may also be blocking the distribution of the heating or the cooling. Are there any that absorb the sound but let the heat or the cooling through? Oh, yeah. These are all interconnected. That's why I think uh, the wellness standards or healthy buildings should really look at all the factors in the indoor environment versus isolated, isolated looking at one at a time. So that's, that's a really good point. Yeah, that's it's a it's it's a focus of the whole. Dallas is is looking at the whole, um, including the health of the occupants. Now, another thing that you look at that Cliff and I commonly find it can be a problem in buildings and in homes is the occupants themselves. How do you deal with the occupants in buildings, and what what are innovative ways that Dallas is looking at how occupants affect the indoor environment? Yeah. Um... Occupants definitely uh, is, is the big um, um, components of, of indoor environment. First of all, the entire healthy building or the built environment is the goal is to make, make people healthier or happier, right? We are the objectives. We are the, the goals and targets of any building. But at the same time, mathematically, if you think about building as a mathematical model, we are the biggest uh, disturbance, right? We are the biggest uh, disruptors um, for that same target. We generate CO2, which is one of the biggest uh, drivers in IAQ, in indoor air quality, to you know, impact our uh, um, uh, cognitive performance, you know, making our feel drowsy. We are the biggest generator of that, and we all know that. Um, and we also wear different, um, I don't know, clothing or, perfumes and those are VOCs, volatile organic compounds, right? Um, they may not be harmful, but they're definitely can be older. <laughs> um, and, and lastly, our behavior, our activities at home in offices typically generates more pollutants than anything else. Um, for example, cooking, uh, use stove cooking, gas uh, fired uh, stove cooking is one of the biggest generator of indoor PM and CO2 as well, um, in, even in the, in the US, even in developed countries. Obviously in developing countries, you burn coal or burn woods, that's even worse. But even for gas, um, gas stoves, that generation of PM is one of the major pollutants uh, in indoor environments. So yeah, it's, it's uh, I think the first thing we do, so your question is how do we deal with that, right? Right. The first thing we do, is to give people awareness what you do and how do you how does that work for your environment and how does that impact your health? That's why I think indoor air quality monitoring, continuous monitoring, is the key for that. Um, so only especially in air quality, you 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 don't see most of the time or all the time you don't see unless the PM is so high, um, like a sandstorm or the mm -hmm. wildfire, otherwise you wouldn't see that. So how do you visualize? How do you make people aware? How do you educate people? How do you let people know if you're cooking, please turn on your uh, range hood uh, so, so it's less smoke. Giving people a screen of the sensor and then you will see the data while you're doing things, that's really, really helpful. Um, it's very intuitive. So that's I think that's the first step. Uh, once you have that, you give people practical solutions to mitigate that um, mitigates for example if you are uh, turn on your air purifier into auto mode if you're you're cooking and if it's in the kitchen if you're cooking range hood is not powerful enough there's smoke out uh, you know coming out then the air purifier detects that smoke level goes up then automatically trigger the uh, uh, higher fan speed of the air purifier that works, right? You don't need to do anything. It's all in the background. So, um, so those are the, some of the things we see and we know that's very effective. You know, but it's interesting because going back to discussion of acoustics, that's part of the reason people don't use the range hoods is the, I know. the sound is so irritating. Um, so you're oftentimes dealing with competing interests, I think, and trying to find that sweet spot in the middle. 
definitely. Now we're gonna. Uh, uh, do you have to? Do you have a hard stop at one o'clock? We got started a little late. Can you stick around an extra five minutes? Or yes, I can. Great. I got a couple of excellent questions here, and I want to try and tie them into things that we had already um, kind of prepared for here. And one of them is on air movement. And let's see, I'm trying to find it. Uh, but it, it had to do with looking at the air movement within buildings. And I know that in preparing for the show, you had looked at um, some research on how illnesses are kind of just um, captured or, uh, you know, how illness goes from person to person within buildings. And I wonder if you could kind of give us your thoughts on, on the latest research on how people get these, you know, things like um, flus and, and of course, COVID. Yeah. Yeah, I think so far, um, after three years, we all know today that uh, COVID is airborne, right? It's, it's transmitted mostly by uh, what, what we call aerosol particles. That's basically particles, very small, fine particles in the air and moving around. So we know that's the main transmission mode of COVID or any other uh, airborne disease like flu and RSVs. So we know that. The, the question and the research we are doing is, how do we minimize that? How do we reduce that from one, uh, one room to the other room and from one person to the other person? So we, we have conducted studies in our well even lab uh, over the past few years, three years, um, in classrooms and recent, the most recent study we've done is in, our, uh, in the well even lab in the, um, in the sector of skilled nursing home. So what we did is literally take two rooms side by side and then put a, a dummy, uh, a mulligan, a dummy uh, ventilator, uh, basically simulating he's, uh, he's uh, breathing out the uh, 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 virus particles. Um, so um, that's in one room. That's a sick person in one room, and then the other room is empty. And what we did is we measure how his, uh, his or its it's, it's uh, aerosol particles transmit from one room uh, in the pattern to the other room, um, how they transmit in the air, how they, um, how they uh, drop on the surface, uh, on the tables. And then we measure that. And then we also put in the localized, hyper-localized air purifications in those rooms and see how those solutions can reduce the transition or tr transmission um, of of that um, you know, simulated uh, virus particle from one room to the other. And the result is phenomenal. Obviously it's as expected because we all know air purification is very, very effective in, in reducing the aerosol particles. Um, and, 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 but seeing this results in, in, real, in real, real time and, and seeing that in a real nursing facility, in, uh, um, I, I guess next door in our volume lab, is really impactful. So basically, I believe the reduction uh, from the peak of the, um, the aerosol particle using uh, without using uh, purifier is about 60 to 70 percent, um, the reduction in that uh, sick room. And the reduction of the sick uh, virus particles from one room to the other is 90 percent by using that. So you're not only uh, reducing the aerosol particle within that space, but also cutting off the the transmission from one room to the other. Um, so that's really powerful in senior living, right? In nursing home, in senior living facility, because rooms are next to each other, and uh, you want to prevent uh, or reduce the likelihood of uh, in person in person to person transmission. So that's that's one of the latest study we have uh, conducted. It's still in peer review, so not published yet. Uh, this is the uh, High level I can talk about, um, but we'll, we can definitely share the paper after it's published. Uh, we actually lost Joe, so I'll be taking over oh. at least temporarily okay. or maybe permanently. We'll, we'll see exactly what happens. We do have a, a good question from a listener. And, you know, with a company like yours that has a wide uh, footprint, you know, the uh, North America, uh, Europe, Asia, uh, the Middle East, and so on and so forth. Um, 
What are you doing in terms of raising awareness that indoor air quality should be a human right, not just something for rich people? That's that's an excellent question, and this is a question uh, near and dear to my heart as well. Um, so it's yeah, I, I think um, a couple of levels. First, we are uh, involved uh, in our IWBI International Wellbeing Institute. And also at Dallas level, we are involved in uh, some of the uh, policy making, uh, both from standards developing and 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 uh, and the uh, incentives for for agencies. So we're involved in those those activities. So that's our uh, we want to be contributing our knowledge to the general public. That's one. Uh, number two. We're also very involved with academic um, institutions and academic uh, research. So a lot of the research, uh, we partner with many universities and many researchers within universities to, to publish papers and to really make sure our knowledge is not, it's not, a, it's, it's not a, it's our asset, but we don't, we don't need to sell them, right? It's, it's free for public. Um, it's a, it's a knowledge transfer that we want to do for for the general public. And in that sense, the well building standard, that's the entire standard is free for anyone to read it. Every single citation and papers and the uh, references we have is is there. It's listed there. So whoever wants to learn, it's uh, it's free for for all. Um, I think yeah, I th I think that's that's the major ways we're doing day in day out. But obviously. Um, there are a lot more we can do on that front um, and uh, open to any ideas. Um, what about airflow patterns, you know, with, within buildings? Uh, are you doing any research in that particular area? Yes, we do. Um, so what we do, um, there are two types of research in airflow patterns. One is the actual measurements in the physical space that we can do, uh, which we are doing uh, in our well living laboratory of uh, actually measure the flow pattern using the tracer to see how the airflow moves. Another type what we do, we call computational fluent dynamic CFDs. We do, we again, we partner with academic institutions, partner with the experts in the field. Uh, we do those type of studies. And because we have the well living lab as a physical laboratory, uh, we can validate our CFD study, which is cheap, fast, right? Uh, it's, uh, uh, it's a computational, it's modeling, but we can validate that results with our actual testing. So that's the two levels of things we do in our uh, research group. Thank you. What about uh, kitchen ventilation? I guess both in residential situations yes. and in, um, you know, just, just commercial buildings. Yeah, um, so I think that's a very specific question. Uh, we do, um, so in the well even lab, we do have simulated residential modules. So basically if you walk into that lab, you feel like it's in the home. There's a, there's a hood, there's a kitchen, and, and we definitely have the capacity to do that. Um, but today, I, I don't think we have done specifically uh, we have done some research with, with the kitchen airflow and all that, uh, but to your specific question, I don't think we have done the, the flow patterns and, and, the, and the goal, if, it, if the goal is to, to optimize the range foot and doing those things. Um, yeah, we have a capacity and we'd love to do it, but there are other priorities right now. Understood. You know, what's interesting in my home, which is about 25 years old, we do not have a kitchen uh, vent to it. But what they did at the, at the time that we had it and the home was built, uh, what they did is they had a, a fan that was actually underneath the stove. So essentially mm -hmm. it, it pulled down and then uh, exhausted. It would seem to me that, you know, perhaps by working uh, both sides below and above, and I'm not sure whether anyone's done that or actually studied that, uh, seems like that might make a difference. There's when, you know, going back to the lighting thing, um, with all the research you're doing on lighting and spectrums of lighting and, and, and so on and so forth, uh, have you encountered uh, any, uh, you know, negative consequences or unexpected consequences 
based on either spectrums of light, you know, causing degradation or producing gases, you know, such as ozone or hydroxyls or uh, peroxides or, or anything, anything like that. Um, for sure, yeah. I think I think if you expand the definition of lighting from just visible lights, that you know, for our functional, you know, seeing the lights, if you expand that into, uh, let's say the the um, what do you call the UVCs, right? The um, ultraviolet light uh, type C uh, lighting. Right. The spectrum of that light is about two hundred nanometers mm -hmm. uh, ish, two hundred twenty. Um, those lighting, um, the purpose for those lighting is not for our illumination, right? It's for sanitization. Those lights, you see purple lights in restaurants or in hospitals. Those are the those type of lights. Those lights will be um, uh, because they are. The, the the usage, the function of those lights is to kill viruses and bacteria on the surface, right? And, and the, the reason they can do that is those lighting are so powerful, they can basically oxidize the uh, living organisms. Um, but in that process, some of the spectrum of that lighting can generate ozone. Mm -hmm. Ozone, which is a harmful uh, gas to, to human. So that's why we always recommend, hey, do not use those lighting while people are occupied. You can use that during daytime or during nighttime when people start leaving, or you can use that, you know, um, uh, when it's empty. Um, so that's that's something we find. But 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 we do see recently during COVID a special a specific uh, spectrum of that UVC lighting are studied recently to not really generating ozone. So uh, in theory, you can use that lighting to well people are around, um, obviously not exposed to that light, but you know, people are around without ozone. Uh, but there are also practical concerns, how reliable the LED that's generating those lighting to specific spectrum, not, not deteriorate to another spectrum, right? That's happens to LED that changes color from time to time. Right. Um, so, so those are practical concerns, but in theory, yeah, there's new technology, something like that. Well, you know, we thank you for joining us. We always like to give our guests the last word. So is there any any final comments or anything, uh, you know, that you would like to say to the audience today? Yeah, yeah, thank you so much. Um, um, I, I think, first of all, I want to say thank you for inviting me here uh, to talk about this. It's, it's my pleasure to share knowledge about IAQ or IEQ, right? Indoor environmental quality as a whole. Um, it's it's, it's, it's a super, super important to me personally, but also to our company to raise awareness that these things are important. These things are important to our health, mentally, physically. So um, that's, that's point number one. Number two, uh, I think there's so, so much uh, low hanging fruit available in the market, available for our behavioral and policy wise that we can do to make our environment better uh, for our health and well-being, but also for sustainability for the whole planet. And those low hanging fruits needs to be known better. Um, so yeah, thanks again. And, uh, and uh, uh, hopefully there's more opportunities to talk more on these topics. Well, we've got great comments from listeners. They thank you for what you're doing and for joining us today. And uh, you know, uh, as Joe said, perhaps we'll have you back on a future show and continue the discussion. Uh, my name is Cliff Zeman Slotnick. Uh, I'm signing off, and we hope that you enjoy uh, today's broadcast. And we look forward to uh, talking to you again next week. Zeman signing off. Thank you. Thank you so for much. IAQ Radio. I'm Spike Reed saying thanks for listening. 